Leslie is going to pick a little bit on IBAs, I think, because she's going to talk about one of those things I mentioned is kind of ha happening while we're half asleep in the mineral sector during these low cycles. It's a, it's a, it's a project that's going through uh, with the current omnibus bill in Canada, which, uh, which is C43, I think it's called, and it's a discussion about uh, payments to governments by extractives and the publication thereof, and it will apply to every publicly reporting company in Canada, whether they're working overseas or whether they're working in Canada. So uh, Leslie's going to talk about that. Leslie, as the manager of Aboriginal Affairs and Resource Development for the PDAC, leads the development of research, advocacy, and projects that support Aboriginal participation in the mineral industry and improving relationships between companies and community. Leslie is focused on collaborating with the mineral sector, Aboriginal communities, and leaders at various levels of government to actively promote greater understanding and cooperation between Aboriginal communities in, this, in the mineral sector. Leslie represents PDEC at national conferences and events, and she volunteers in a number of advisory committees throughout the sector. She manages the Aboriginal program at the PDEC uh, annual convention that is now renowned for providing a platform for discussion on fostering mutually cooperative, respectful, and successful relationships. Since uh, PD, joining PDEC in 2009, she's held the position of program assistant and program manager and has been involved in a number of PDEC programs, including Aboriginal Affairs, CSR, uh, geoscience, lands, and regulation, and apparently uber regulations in the federal scheme of things. Uh, Leslie holds an MA in communications and culture. Welcome, Leslie. Good afternoon. Thanks, Bill, and thanks for uh, inviting PDC to uh, speak today about resource revenue transparency. So. I will be giving an overview of uh, resource, uh, what transparency is, and the PEC's involvement in the initiative, and of course the government's uh, new extractive, extractive Sector Transparency Measures Act, which also includes uh, the disclosure of, of payments to Aboriginal groups, and probably raises more questions than provides answers. So resource revenue transparency, what is it? is the mandatory public disclosure of payments made to governments by extractive companies. So the responsibility lies with companies to report what they pay. So there are a number of arguments that uh, support the need for revenue transparency. Uh, so it helps to quantify the economic benefits of our industry. It can help to provide citizens um, and communities with information to hold their governments accountable for the amount and the management of uh, resource revenues they receive. It can help to deter corruption and bribery, bribery, and it can also provide valuable information to help investors better analyze their financial and political risks of their investments. And it can also help companies uh, somewhat achieve their social license or contribute to achieving their social license to operate, as the information may help companies more credibly communicate their uh, financial contributions and their impact to local and national uh, economies and demonstrate their tang the tangible benefits that they have. So while transparency may not be the silver bullet uh, that immediately leads to improved governance and, account and public accountability, is certainly one of uh, a tool that can help achieve these things. So a little bit about the uh, context behind uh, transparency in Canada and PDC's involvement in the issue. Over the years, there have been a number of mandatory reporting requirements that have been developed around the world, which really has pressured Canada to also go down this road. So in the U.S., the Dodd-Frank Act was passed in July 2010, and it requires companies that file annual reports on the U.S. Stock Exchange to disclose the payments that they make to the governments of countries where they operate on a project-by-project -project and country-by-country -country basis. The European Union has also made moves to adopt similar legislation, and this will be ratified by the individual member states of the EU. And then there's the Extractive Ind Industries Transparency Initiative, or EITI, um, and this is uh, another transparency mechanism, but it is, uh, it's a voluntary global framework that is implemented by countries uh, individually. So Canada has been a supporting country, but not an implementing country of EITI. So a little bit about the PDEC's history with uh, 
revenue transparency, which was a separate process from the government's, but which helped inform the Canadian government's legislation. So in 2011, the PDAC was approached by uh, two NGOs that focus on revenue transparency, Publish What You Pay Canada and Revenue Watch Institute. The Mining Association of Canada was also uh, approached by these two groups. So these NGOs were really looking to work uh, collabor co collaboratively with industry on this issue, noting the gap in Canada around transparency. So after uh, quite a bit of consideration, uh, the PDC and, and its board decided that, as well as MAC, decided that it was uh, the right moment and a really good opportunity for us to get involved in this initiative. So we recognized the global trend towards resource revenue transparency, and we knew it was only a matter of time until the Canadian government would move to create legislation. We also wanted to make sure that we were at the table um, to help build this from the ground up. And we wanted to ensure that future reporting requirements would be um, suitable for the exploration sector and for our members and not uh, overly burdensome. So the four organizations formed what was uh, what's affectionately known as the Resource Revenue Transparency Working Group, or short, for short, the Working Group, um, in order to develop recommendations on the mandatory disclosure of payments of uh, companies to governments, with the intention of presenting these to the Canadian government for, uh, for adoption. So the Working Group took around 18 months to consult with our members, uh, civil society, and other folks, and there was general support for the concept of transparency. So in 2014, um, our working group released our uh, recommendations on mandatory disclosure. So I won't go through all of the details because you can look at the recommendations that uh, we made in its document online. Um, but here's a snapshot of some of the key components uh, of the working group's recommendations on transparency or mandatory reporting. So in terms of venue, um, oh, I should mention that it was quite an interesting negotiation process between, uh, you know, the industry associations and the NGOs. So for venue, we felt that it would be best to implement a mandatory disclosure framework through securities regulation and, and ensuring equivalency with uh, other jurisdictions such as the US and the EU. In terms of scope, the working group recommended a framework that would re require all mining companies listed in Canada to report their payments made to national and subnational governments. So two points about this. Oil and gas, they were excluded. Uh, the reason was they um, were curious and interested in our project but they were not interested in participating at that time. So there is also, um, which is kind of the topic of today, there is also the decision um, by all four working group members not to include the, disclo the disclosure of Aboriginal payments in the framework. Not that there was not, uh, obviously there was support for transparency, but it was seen to be a bit more of a complex issue. So we really wanted to get the our framework off the ground and running before introducing this very complex element. Um, so we also felt that additional consultation was required with both industry and with Aboriginal groups before kind of throwing that into the transparency mix. So as you can see on the slide, we also outlined an array of payment categories that would be included in a transparency framework. And in terms of threshold, uh, this was also a big point of discussion. The working, uh, the working group actually recommended that there be two uh, thresholds to be uh, reported. One was the $100,000 threshold to ensure equivalency with the US and the EU. Um, but we also suggested a voluntary threshold of $10,000. And that was really to ensure that um, exploration companies would be uh, part of this process and that the payments that they made would also be quantified. Uh, finally, uh, the working group was recommending that companies uh, report their payments on a, also on a project by project level in order to uh, disaggregate the information so that uh, for communities and accountability reasons, and again, of course, to better quantify the contributions that our industry makes on a more local level versus a country by country level. So, the Government of Canada's process. Um, they began their work on uh, revenue transparency 
while we were doing our work as the working group. Uh, in 2013, the Prime Minister announced that Canada, like the US and the EU, would be establishing mandatory reporting requirements by 2015. Uh, Natural Resources Canada, or NRCAN, they worked closely with PDEC and MAC during their process and we kept them apprised of the work that we were doing throughout. Um, we, were, we were told by uh, NRCAN that the working group's recommendations that we released <clears throat> in January of 2014, that they would be incorporated uh, into the government's legislation to some degree. So at the end of October, a few weeks ago, the government introduced its uh, revenue transparency legislation, the Extractive, Extractive Sector Transparency Measures Act. Uh, while the bill is currently being discussed in Parliament, NRCAN has set up a process to develop a reporting template for companies in order to report their payments. Um, <clears throat> and as well, the advisory committee will help develop the uh, guidance document for uh, industry. So NRCAN has established this advisory group uh, to, set, to kind of prepare, help feed into these two items. And so representatives from exploration, mining, and oil and gas will be participating, and PDEC and MAC will be observers at the table. So that brings us to the actual act itself. Uh, I won't go through all of the details, as riveting as they are, um, but then... <laughs> The next few slides point to some of the differences between um, what the Act, what's in the Act, and what the PDEC and the Working Group had originally recommended, and raise some of the, the questions that, that we have as a result of, uh, of the Act that we hope that can be addressed by the advisory group. So as you can see on the slide, the uh, government's objective for the Act is solely focusing on fighting corruption, uh, whereas as I, as I mentioned earlier, there are quite a whole host of uh, benefits for uh, transparency for a reporting framework. Furthermore, the government included additional details on what constitutes a payee or what constitutes a payment. The working group's uh, scope of reporting identified only national and subnational authorities, but they took that a bit further in terms of employees, public, public office holders, in-kind payments as well are mentioned, but not really uh, defined very well. Uh, the Act also states that a controlling entity is required to report on behalf of its subsidiaries. Uh, the working group had recommended that both the parent companies and subsidiaries uh, report. And in terms of filing, the Act requires that uh, companies report within 150 days at the end of their fiscal year. Interestingly, for the EU, they have 11 months. Uh, our working group recommended that the disclosure of payments take place on an annual basis, but in line with uh, the fiscal year of reporting companies. So a major difference between the Act and the working group recommendations is that it applies to oil and gas, despite their unwillingness to come to the table. Uh, their sec this was obviously, like I said, excluded from uh, our work because they had kind of declined the invitation and preferred to just observe. Uh, another difference is the application of the Act. The working group had suggested that um, mandatory reporting apply to public companies reporting under Canadian securities legislation. The new uh, Transparency, Transparency Measures Act, however, will ensure that companies that are not listed in Canada but that meet the qualifications there in bullet two um, on the slide will have to report, which will likely include some private companies. And of course, the government has left themselves some wiggle room with the and any other prescribed entity. In terms of thresholds, uh, the act differs, uh, it, dif it, it differs from our recommendations. They did not include the $10,000 voluntary uh, disclosure piece. Um, more importantly, however, as you can see in the sub-bullet A, um, the Act allows the government to assign a different threshold or a different amount that has to be reported based on an individual category of payment rather than simply the $100,000 uh, total. So this kind of uh, opens the door for the possibility for government to assign, let's say, a lower amount uh, that has to be disclosed for a certain payment category, let's say uh, infrastructure improvements or bonuses. 
In terms of format uh, for reporting payments, the working group had recommended disaggregated reporting at the project level in an electronic format and as a separate form through an annual securities filing. These stipulations were to ensure the information is organized, consistent, easily accessed, and disaggregated enough to actually be useful. It is not clear through the Act whether the, uh, if reporting will be mandated on a project-by-project -project basis, and there is no clear definition of the term project, which will be crucial for folks moving forward. The Act also doesn't specify how uh, company reports will actually be made public. Um, NRCAN has suggested that companies will have to post, uh, post their reports or their payments on their website and submit the link to them. Uh, which obviously raises some challenges around things like broken links, accessibility issues, uh, and inconsistent formatting, which could make the data very difficult to interpret and understand. And of course, it's the public nature of these reports that is so critical to the transparency project. For venue, the working group recommended uh, provincial securities regulators. Um, the Transparency Act has companies reporting to the federal government. Um, I guess the benefit for this is that uh, there may not be discrepancies in reporting and publication of the information. However, you can see that Section 20 of the Act allows um, the provinces to adopt their own regulations above and beyond the federal venue, and Quebec has uh, already announced that they would be doing this. It is unclear how this will work exactly, and it will be important that the provincial mechanisms are consistent so that data can be compared, and so it can be used by investors and civil society, et cetera, and of course that it doesn't impose any uh, additional reporting burdens on companies. In terms of penalties, the um, the Act sets out a penalty of $250,000, and uh, the working group didn't really list an amount. We just suggested that the penalties are consistent with the current enforcement regime of provincial securities disclosure requirements, and of course that they be um, proportionate to their violation. And Saving the best for last, uh, we have the transitional provision in the Act which will require companies to disclose payments made to Aboriginal groups, which is described on the screen here. So it's kind of what Adam was talking about. This is the definition of Aboriginal groups or Aboriginal governments and entities that will be, that will be captured. In June 2013, the government indicated that they would be including uh, payments to Aboriginal groups in their mandatory disclosure framework, which was something that I mentioned the working group and the PDC had uh, wanted to keep to the side for the time being. Uh, we asked the government, and uh, as did MAC, when they were drafting this legislation, if they would uh, give a two-year kind of transitional period to allow for transparency to get off the ground and of course to allow for more consultation with industry and Aboriginal groups around the payments that they actually make. So this one is interesting and uh, well as with the rest, uh, there are a number of outstanding questions that are related to uh, the disclosure of payments made to Aboriginal groups much more than here. But uh, we hope that these will be addressed uh, through the advisory, the advisory group with NRCAN. So things like what are the challenges that industry uh, may face uh, by including this uh, requirement? Will the payment categories that have to be disclosed be the same for payments for Aboriginal groups as they are for, let's say, subnational governments? How will infrastructure investments or even social payments uh, be reflected or be included? Um, when it comes to the in-kind provision, how will you quantify things like apprenticeships and contributions made uh, by companies to communities in that way? And will payments to Aboriginal businesses be captured and what will the impacts be? So will we see less community-run businesses and more uh, Aboriginal individually owned business uh, as a result of this? And um, of course the question about agreements and given their confidentiality clauses, what will the impacts be of having to disclose payments over a hundred thousand dollars? And uh, one of the, you know, a large concern uh, by community members has been what will be done with this information. So if this 
will result in cuts to uh, federal uh, transfer payments to communities. And then I think on the flip side for industry, the concern if that were to happen would be, are we going to be expected to fill the funding gap as a result of these possible cuts? So again, I, I guess we really hope that these questions will be addressed through the advisory group. And that is transparency in a nutshell. So uh, as I mentioned, probably more questions than answers. If you have any comments or concerns that you, you have, uh, please feel free to email them so that we can bring them up in future discussions with uh, NRCAN and hopefully through the advisory group. Thanks. Assuming it was a perfect uh, governing world, Leslie, the first implementation year for this would be no, for the for the so next year, your payments to government will be published in your reporting mechanisms, folks. Just in case you hadn't noticed it, it's for next year. Tell your CFOs 